near the close of Jesus' ministry, he took one last opportunity to sit on the top of the Mount of Olives. He just re recently told his disciples of the calamity that would soon overtake the temple. And now they wanted to receive further instruction just how this was going to happen and how would it usher in the end of the world. And after listing a number of natural and man-made disasters, Jesus said very clearly to them, he that endures to the end, the same shall be saved. And then he shared what must have appeared as the most impossible task ever commissioned to men. This gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations. And then shall the end come. If we think the task is ominous today, what must it have been like for those poor disciples back then? Their little club was, had barely sta started. Their membership had a grand total of 12, excluding the master. The language barrier alone would no doubt present itself as a horrific impasse. And this says nothing of the lack of the technical, the technical tools that you and I have. 3ABN was a long, long ways away. Satellite evangelism was hardly an option either. So you have to keep in mind that at that time, they knew little of the power of Pentecost. But what is remark especially remarkable is that within less than half a century, what had been thought of as an impossibility had been accomplished in the then known world. Impossibilities are the very things that God loves to major in. I haven't the faintest doubt in my mind that if we would find ourselves in the early disciples situation today, we would cringe and very possibly cower before the task. A quick glance at the territory we've been called to evangelize, a, a stare into the eyes of those who are indifferent and whose hearts are faint and our hearts would grow faint. Now, I don't mean to come down on anybody in particular. We're the product of the society that we live in today. Aggressively preaching the gospel is hardly who we are as Canadians, Seventh-day Adventists, but it still remains that the job was given to you and me. And should we conclude that somehow God mistook us for somebody else, or is it possible that he knows exactly who we are and what we're capable of when placed in his hands? So I wanna share with you an example from the Bible of an individual who considered himself less than qualified material. I want you to open your Bibles. I hope you brought your Bible. If you don't have a Bible, you might have a device. You can look it up in your device. But I want you to turn to Judges chapter 6. Judges chapter 6. Less than 50 years had gone by since the great victory that had taken place with Deborah and Barak. When again, the children of Israel were swept off their feet by the sins of the surrounding nations. It doesn't take us much to forget the way the Lord has led in the past. And before long, we find ourselves questioning and groveling and wondering. And Our conversion may have been a Damascus experience like that of Paul, yet before too many years managed to go by, lo and behold, things that we gladly gave up in our lives as unfit for the Christian life have somehow crept back in and with our permission to boot. And so it was in the days of the judges. Now in this narrative, we find the children of Israel delivered into the hands of the Midianites. Somehow they had forgotten that God had placed them in Canaan, not simply for their own benefit, and comfort in the book, Patriarchs and Prophets, it says God had placed his people in Canaan as a mighty, a mighty breastwork to stay the tide of moral evil 
that it might not flood the world. Their lives were supposed to be an influence for good in the world that they were living in at that time. But in spite of their high destiny, they allowed themselves to slide into a course of ease and self-indulgence. The opportunities to completely conquer the land forever slipped from reach and idolaters, the idolaters surrounding them soon became pricks in their eyes and thorns in their sides. And as a result, a lot of people, especially those living in the countryside, were often, they would often have to hide themselves in the rocks and in the caves and the crevices of the mountains from the enemy. Look at verse 3, chapter 6, Judges 6, verse 3. And so it was, whenever Israel had sown, Midianites would come up, also Amalekites and the people of the east would come up against them, and then they would encamp against them and destroy the produce of the, the earth as far as Gaza, and leaving no sustenance for Israel, neither sheep, nor ox, nor donkey, where would they come up with their, their, their livestock and their tents coming in as numerous as locusts, both they and their camels were without number, and they would enter the land to destroy it. I don't suppose any of us have ever had the misfortune of having grasshoppers swarm in and destroy our crops like they do in some prairies or what have you. To the Israelites, these intruders must have had the appearance, that appearance and the destruction left in their wake must have been disheartening to say the least. Verse 6 says that in Israel was greatly impoverished because of the Midianites and the children of Israel cried out to the Lord for help. And they cried out unto the Lord. Have you ever noticed how often the children of Israel cried out unto the Lord? <laughs> if you've read your whole Bible, you must wonder. Somebody must have counted how many times this has happened over and over and over. What's really remarkable is that time and again, in spite of the fact that they kept failing and, and missing the, the point, and God would see fit to forgive and to deliver them from their waywardness. In Psalm 50, verse 15, it's one of my favorite verses in the Bible. I know I say that about a lot of verses, but this is one that I, I, I've remembered now for years and years and years. Call upon me in the day of trouble, and I will do what? I will answer you, and I will deliver you. You know, we're told in the book, uh, Cold Porter Ministry, page 59, it says, in every difficulty, we are to see a call to prayer. Isn't that amazing? Every time you go through some sort of trouble, you ought to take that as a signal from God that it's him calling you and saying, tapping you on the shoulder and saying, pray, pray to me. It's your cue. Come and talk to me. Have you formed the habit of calling on God when trouble comes knocking on your door? Do you realize just how anxious God is to reveal himself as your rescuer, your helper, the one who can resolve every problem and chase away every, every, every enemy. In answer to their supplication, God sent them a prophet to remind them of the many times he had come to their rescue, especially from the bondage of Egypt. The New, uh, New English Bible translates verse 10 this way. It says, I said to you, I am the Lord your God. Do not stand in awe of the gods of the Amorites in whose country you are settling, but you did not listen to me. To stand in awe means to be infatuated, impressed, taken up. I have to admit, I've often been taken up by a lot of things. I marveled at Eve so easily, so easily infatuated, was so easily infatuated by by a talking serpent. But there have been things in my life that I've managed to, fas to fascinate and allure me that were as nothing when compared to a gabby snake. How many things of the world continues to hold a certain fascination in your lives? In spite of our commitment to Christ, are we still drawn to certain questionable things in life? Maybe certain 
entertainment or what have you? Are we caught up with the lives of the rich and the famous or maybe the glamour of Hollywood and, and um, I don't know what, Broadway? Look at verse 14. Chapter 6, verse 14. Now the angel of the Lord came and sat under the terebinth tree, which was in Ophrah, which belonged to Joash the Abiezrite, while his son Gideon threshed wheat in the winepress in order to hide it from the Midianites. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him and said to him, The Lord is with you, you mighty man of valor. <laughs> you can, I can just imagine Gideon kind of chuckling to himself at this point. And so he says to the, to the Lord, Oh, my Lord, if the Lord is with us, then why has all this happened to us? And where are all his miracles, which our fathers told us about, saying, did not the Lord bring us up out from Egypt? But now the Lord has forsaken us and has delivered us into the hands of the Midianites. And then the Lord turned to him and said, go in this might of yours, and you shall save Israel from the hand of the Midianites. Have I not sent you? I want you to take note of God's opinion of Gideon. The Lord is with you, he says, thou mighty man of valor. The NIV calls him mighty warrior, valiant warrior in another translation of the Bible. We're told that while his family held no position of leadership, the household of Gideon's father was distinguished for courage and integrity. Later in the story, we're told that each one of his brothers resembled the children of a king. Gideon, however, isn't so quick to pass that kind of positive judgment on himself. In verse 15, he cries, Oh, my Lord, wherewith shall I save Israel? Behold, my family is poor in Manasseh, and I am the least in my father's house. Somehow, he sensed his inefficiency. He really didn't feel qualified for the task that God was placing on him. You ever feel like God is asking you to do something that you really don't think you have what it takes to do? Does that ever happen to you? I will forever praise the Lord for a little bit of advice my brother gave me one time, and this is before we'd become members of the church. I think we had started visiting the church. And anyway, he told me, he says, you know, he says, John, when the pastor or somebody else asks you to do something in the church, somebody of authority in the church, pastor, elder, whatever, if they, if they ask you to do something, then take it as if it's God who's telling you to do this. Don't hesitate. If they're asking you, it's because God has impressed that person to ask you to do this thing. And I've always remembered this, this advice. <laughs> Believe me, I certainly didn't feel like qualified to do much. But I chose to believe that that advice was from God. If I would have known someday that someday I would be standing before you preaching a sermon, I would probably have left the church back then before even joining, and I never would have come back. Forget it. Are you kidding me? In uh, Bible Commentary, book two, page 1003, it says this. It says, the Lord does not always choose for his work men of the greatest talent, but he selects those whom he can best use. Individuals who might do good service for God may for a time be left in obscurity, apparently unnoticed and unemployed by their master, but if they faithfully perform the duties of their humble position, cherishing a willingness to labor and to sacrifice for him, he will, in his own time, and trust them with greater responsibilities. It continues, it says, before honor is humility. The Lord can use most effectually those who are most sensible of their own unworthiness and inefficiency. He will teach them to exercise the courage of faith. He will make them strong by uniting their weakness to his might, wise by connecting their ignorance with his wisdom. I believe that's the reason why God chose Gideon. He had no air about himself, no sense of his own greatness. And like any other human, his faith in God's leading was probably less than picture perfect. For him to get up an army large enough to be able to measure up to the strength of the Midianites, 
must have been foreboding, forget it. Now at this juncture, Gideon isn't yet convinced that this is really from the Lord, you know. So he asks the angel to stay put while he prepares a meal and he asks for some sort of sign that he indeed is a messenger from God. The angel agrees. Gideon prepares the meal. He sets the slaughtered kid and the unleavened cake on a rock and pours broth over the, the whole thing. And at the touch of the angel's staff, the food is immediately consumed and poof, the angel vanishes away. There's no question anymore. Wow, Gideon cries out, alas, O Lord God, because I have seen an angel of the Lord face to face. You know, there's something to, there's some evidence that this may have been no ordinary angel. It could have been the Lord himself. It wouldn't be the first time that Christ personally visited our world back in those days. Abraham, you remember, he approached with uh, three. Uh, he was approached by three strangers, two of whom were angels, the other one was the Lord. When Jacob wrestled with the angel, you remember, he spent the entire night wrestling with this angel, and it wasn't until daybreak before he realized he wasn't fighting an angel; he was fighting the Lord Himself. And it's for this reason the Lord told Gideon in verse 23, peace be to you, do not fear, you shall not die. That very night, the Lord sent Gideon to destroy the grove where his family and his people of that area offered sacrifices to Baal. If you remember the story the next morning, the villagers were in an uproar. And when they found out that Gideon was the culprit who had done this thing, they just wanted to wring his neck. But his father must have, must have been told of his encounter with the angel or something because while he too indulged in the worship of Baal, he came to the defense of his son and challenged the crowd with words that I think should have occurred to idol worshipers a long time before, that they had bowed to the objects of their affection. What is an, what is an idol? And so at verse 31, his father says this to the crowd. He says, why are you defending Baal? If Baal is a, a true God, shouldn't he be able to defend himself? Yeah. Makes sense to me. I wonder if it made sense to them. Are you trying to save him? Let's wait until tomorrow morning. If Baal cannot defend himself, then he is not a real God. Mm. Anyone who thinks that he needs to defend him ought to be executed on the spot. You'll have to excuse my paraphrasing here. But however you look at it, that's the gist of it. Now comes the real challenge. Verse 33. Then all the Midianites and the Amalekites and the children of the east were gathered together and went over and pitched in the valley of Jezreel. The enemy has come together and they're prepared to do battle. Suddenly God's spirit takes hold of Gideon and with a blast of his trumpet, the Abiezrites are gathered together to him and before long several of the tribes have joined their forces with those of Gideon and now the moment of truth has come now I don't know if Gideon's faith wavered a bit or what but he pleads with God for yet another indication he's going to be you're going to be with me right <laughs> like this is getting pretty scary if ever you feel a bit sheepish about your your humanity be it known that God knows and understands the measure of your frailty it doesn't bother him that we're weak, that our faith isn't perfect, that our courage fails from time to time. He doesn't have a problem with that. He knows all that there is to be known about you and your heart and everything. We have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted just as we are. What really concerns him is that we know our true condition. Do you recognize your need of God in your life? If we really understood how weak we really were, I think prayer would make up a greater portion of our day. Gideon asks God to cause the fleece to be drenched with dew while the ground remained dry. And so God didn't hesitate, and so it was. There it was. The ground is all dry. The fleece is sopping wet. Wow, that's amazing, but Gideon's thinking about this whole thing. He says, wait a minute now, that can probably happen. What if the ground was all wet and the fleece was dry? Now that would be a miracle. 
All right, so he turns around and asks God to do that. God doesn't grumble. He doesn't say, oh, you of little faith. He goes ahead and he does it. He knows where Gideon is in his heart. He's in the process of building his, his faith from the foundation. From henceforth, Gideon is going to have an experience in faith that will do him well for years to come. Have you had evidence of God working in your life? Can you look back and, and say, I have witnessed the power of God. I have experienced it firsthand. I know now that my Redeemer lives. Gideon is now prepared to do battle, or so he thinks. The forces of the enemy have positioned themselves. Gideon and his men are doing the, the same when suddenly God tells him that he has too many men. Now, I want you to get this. I want you to understand the whole situation here. Da Gideon stands with an army num that numbers in the thousands, 32 thousand soldiers we're not talking about a small army we're not talking about our congregation here we're talking about a huge it must have just they, they must have appeared as an endless ocean of people 32,000 I've never been in the midst of 32,000 people before what must that have looked like but the problem was was that the enemy had 135,000 soldiers four men to one that's the ratio. So God says to Gideon, you have too many men. If I give you the victory, your men are going to boast that it was all their own doing. <laughs> Those folks were no different than we are today. You know, it's hard to let God when you have a sense of your own natural ability. I want you to turn to chapter 7. Look at verse 3. It continues. So God says this to Gideon. Now, therefore... Proclaim in the hearing of the people, saying, Whoever is fearful and afraid, let him turn and depart at once from Mount Gilead. And 22,000 of the people returned, and it left Gideon with only 10,000. Wow. Wow, that's amazing. Now the ratio is almost 14 to 1. 14 for the enemy. Yikes. Verse 4 continues. But the Lord said to Gideon, the people are still too many. Bring them down to the water and I will test them for you there. And then it will be that of whom I say to you, this one will go, shall go with you, the same shall go with you. And of whom, whomever I say to you, this one shall not go with you, the same shall not go. So he brought the people down to the water and the Lord said to Gideon, everyone who laps from the water with his tongue as a dog laps, you shall set apart by himself. Likewise, everyone who gets down on his knees to drink and the number of those who lapped, putting their hand to their mouth was 300 men, but all the rest of the people got down on their knees to drink water. Then the Lord said to Gideon by the 300 men who lapped, I will save you and deliver the Midianites into your hands. Let all the other people go, every man to his home. Wow. So now, what is it? You know, uh, Mrs. White has a thought in Patriarchs and Prophets. She says this, by the simplest means, character is often tested. Those who in time of peril were intent upon supplying their own wants were not the men to be trusted in an emergency. The Lord has no place in his work for the indolent and self-indulgent. The men of his choice were the few who would not permit their own wants to delay them in the discharge of duty. The 300 chosen men not only possessed courage and self-control, they were men of faith. Those who crouched down with uh, with their faces in the water couldn't possibly keep an eye out on the enemy. They were careless and could very well have cost the lives of many of their, their brethren. Only 100 brought the water up to their mouths with their hands so that they could continue to keep watch for the enemy. We could learn something from this in our own battle with the enemy. But you remember Jesus said, and he said it several times, watch and be ready. Are you always watching? 
Are you always ready? Now our ratio is 450 to 1. The Lord says, okay, (laughs) now you can go to battle. In the next few verses, he tells him to get going. He's delivered the, the Midianites into his hands. We're told that Gideon trembled as he thought of the conflict of the morrow, and rightly so, I would imagine. Verse 12 goes on, it says, And the Midianites and the Amalekites and all the children of the east lay along in the valley like grasshoppers for multitude, and their camels were without number as the sand by the seaside for multitude. If every one of those 135,000 soldiers had a camel of his own, try to imagine in your mind what that must have looked like. It's unbelievable. I want you to notice how gently God moves Gideon along. He says, listen, if this makes you a little bit nervous, I want you to take your servant, get yourself as close to the enemy line as you possibly can, and I want you to listen carefully to what is going on, to what is being said. And what you hear will convince you that I am who I say that I am, and you will have no doubt. Look at verse 13. Verse 13, and when Gideon had come, There was a man telling a dream to his companion, and he said, I have had a dream. To my surprise, a loaf of barley bread tumbled into the camp of the Midians. It came to a tent and struck it so that it fell and overturned, and the tent collapsed. Then his companion answered and said, This is nothing else but the sword of Gideon, the son of Joash, the man of Israel. Into his hand, God has delivered Midian and the whole camp. I tell you, folks, that's all that Gideon needed to hear. He's convinced the Lord is with him. Bowing in worship, he turns and he makes his way back into the camp, rallies his troops, gives them, each one of them, a trumpet in one hand and a torch with a pitcher in the other. He divides them into three groups and has them position themselves around the enemy, and he tells them to watch for him and to do what he does. And once they're ready... He lets go of a blast of his trumpet that must have sounded like a scream of a thousand banshees. Then breaking the pitcher, the crash of 300 more could be heard amid the scream of trumpets and the shout, the sword of the Lord and of Gideon. The Midianites must have thought that demons were coming right out of hell. Panic seized every heart and with swords swinging blindly in every direction, they managed to slaughter 120,000 of their own soldiers. And the rest of the hotly pursued are hotly pursued by Gideon's men and several thousand more who later came to assist in ridding the land of their hatred, hate, hated enemies. With only a few good men, God handed Gideon a victory seldom ever before seen. What a victory. What a God. Do you suppose he could do that for you and me? Sure. What do you think? He's sure. What do the rest of you think? All God requires are a few good men and women. Do we have those here? Sure. In Sons and Daughters, page 279, the Lord is willing to do great things for us. We shall not gain the victory through numbers, but through the full surrender of the soul to Jesus. Are you surrendered to Jesus? Our membership might be quite small. And the task at hand, very ominous and foreboding. I think of those those discovered Bible cards. By the way, I ordered another (laughs) 6,000. So we're we're just going to keep pouring into Charlotte County. We're just going to keep pouring those cards out because I know it's going to, there are going to be people who are going to respond to them. We may be very, very small, but it's quite evident from Gideon's experience. God is not limited by numbers. Do you get it? Do you understand it? Do you believe it? As a matter of fact, it appears that he is quite comfortable with working with only a handful if necessary. God loves the impossible. He did it with Gideon. He did it with the disciples. And he can do it with us. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations. And then the end will come. 
All he asks is for a few good men. Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, yes, the task is ominous. So many thousands of people who need to hear about Jesus. So many people who are on the wrong track. So many people who are going to Christless graves. Dear Father in heaven, put it on our hearts, we pray, to do everything we possibly can with the assurance you are going to make it happen. It's not us. It's nothing that we have. We are inefficient. We are just like Gideon. But you love what's impossible, and you will do the impossible, even if only with a few good men. And we praise you and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.